jeepers! You're listening to Smash or Pass! Hello everyone, welcome back to another interview. I am JB and joining me is Sophie. Hey. We have Dan. Hi. And the special guest who will be interviewing today is Mr. Zach Moncrief. Thank you so much for joining us. Woo! Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be here and talk to you all. I mean, it is an amazing honour, and I guess just to get things kick-started, I just want to start off by admiring your background today. Like, that <laughs> be cool Scooby-Doo canvas or poster. Like, I think every single one of us in this call wishes that we could break in and steal it, as, to sound as leash-threatening as possible. Yeah, it's really fun. Out of all the things that um, that I was able to get any kind of access to on the show, uh, I have the few things. Like, I've got the sweatshirts I made for the crew on right now, which has the wonderful little, uh, our little logo and our fun little image on the back. Mm -hmm. And then um, that one poster was like a, a very early on poster that they had made that I kind of jacked from the studio at one point and brought to the recordings and got the cast to sign it. Cause I'm like, I just want to have at least one thing from our show that I can always like kind of hold on to. And I, the cast was so incredible and so wonderful to work with and such an honor to work with them that it's like the one really cool piece that I have. It's not my favorite art of the show, but it still is a really cool kind of teaser piece that I will hold on to for forever. So yeah, I'm super excited uh, to have it. And I'm glad you, uh, you noticed it. Yeah, I mean, genuinely, I think I'll be a bit distracted throughout this whole entire interview, just there, like, imagining just, just, oh, it's just crazy. So uh, please do forgive me if I am a bit overzealous throughout this recording. But, you know, we love Scooby-Doo, we love Be Cool Scooby-Doo. But in terms of getting to know you and your career, I'd like to take it back to a more or less the start, if that's okay, please. So yeah. looking on IMDb, I can see that your career kickstarted in about 1996. But before that, what was your history with animation? and What kind of led you up to pursuing this as a career? Yeah, you know, first, let me just quickly say really, really broadly, I, I'm so appreciative that you're doing this whole podcast, by the way. Um, the things that as being someone who's an educator and an, a, a student myself of the industry, I'm always searching online to find this kind of material to just find out little bits and pieces of how it's done, how it's made, what what inspires everyone. And uh, although I don't feel like I have anything wonderful to offer, I know that I will hopefully say something to somebody during this whole thing that this whole discussion that inspires somebody to keep pursuing this career or pursuing this art form. So that being said, I started off drawing as most of us in the industry really, really young. I was drawing back when, as far as I can remember, uh, I used to draw from the, the old Peanuts cartoon strips that we had in the Sunday paper. Snoopy was my favorite thing to do. And uh, that followed in with me just watching animation constantly. I fell into the old Warner Brothers shorts was kind of my pocket of where I went. And uh, it was a wonderful, huge escape for me. And, uh, you know, as we see in the in the world right now, uh, my mom dealt with a lot of depression and a lot of issues with brain tumors and whatnot. And it was the one thing that she and I connected on that I saw her brightness come in. I saw her lift up and it kind of like fed this thing for me. Like, how cool would it be that because of what I can do on paper, because of the way my mind thinks, if I can maybe work on something that can bring someone else that kind of escape and that kind of joy and that kind of fun like what a cool thing to be able to do and i can also get paid and like feed my family and have a house and <laughs> hell yeah why wouldn't i want to do that right so um uh my love for animation all that had really started during that time period and uh i then uh was getting uh a moped license when i was a teenager at a dmv dmv is where we take our tests to get our licenses right and i was just drawing and this person sitting next to me saw that I was drawing and mentioned this school. I was like, have you ever heard of this school called CalArts out in California? It's a Walt Disney started a school that really focuses in animation. And um, I had never heard about it. No one at my school in New Jersey had ever heard about it. And it's one of those like amazing moments where I'm like, without that person being in that, in that moment at that time, I would have never found my way. I don't think at least in the path that I, that I was able to go on into this uh, career. So um, I applied to the school and was one of the lucky ones that got in on the first run kind of thing and came right from high school directly out to CalArts and started really getting my knowledge and getting my education on animation. At that time, there was maybe two books out there that you could find uh, 
Um, one called the Preston Blair uh, book that was all about animation and a really great Disney book called The Illusion of Life. And anyone that's still interested in animation, if you've not seen those, you should at least look into those two books because there are many, many other things out there that are wonderful as well, but they're still staples for most people in the industry. So I don't know, did that help answer um, a little bit of what you were looking for? Yeah, definitely. And um, were there any shows or particular animators that you watched growing up that you feel have sort of influenced your career in a way? That's really tough. You know, like I said, the Warner Brothers shorts where it was Chuck Jones and Tex Avery and Bob Clampett, those were the shows and the things that made me laugh and was most excited for. And at that same time of me coming into Cal Arts was Roger Rabbit hit. And that couldn't have been more of a great combo of classic Disney animation and yet that broad, over the top, uh, cartoony uh, Warner Brothers style. And so it was like the perfect like, like gift to me as what I wanted to do. Although uh, it's not really the kind of stuff that I do. Like um, Be Cool to me is not as broad and zany and cartoony as Warner Brothers is, but it's the, the comedic style and the filmmaking style of how that show is done is more in my heart of what I like being a part of. Um, uh, I still love all of it, but it's just the, the place that I feel the most comfortable, I think. Um, well, you've already touched on it, but um, uh, your website mentions that you studied at CalArts. Um, what was the experience like? It was incredible. Uh, it was very humbling too. You know, coming from a small town in New Jersey where I was probably the best artist in the school at the time easily, uh, showing up to CalArts and being around the top talent in the industry uh, was really, it was, almost, it was almost debilitating at first because I was sitting around people that were so talented and so incredible and so inspiring, but also just made you realize how much you had to still learn. Um, but it was also just the most amazing experience because of how much I learned and got exposed to while I was there. Again, like I said, coming from that time period, there was not much out there. We didn't have DVDs or YouTubes or anything that you could go finding all this amazing information on all this back, uh, all this kind of like director commentary and whatnot. So for me, it was just like a moment to just be a sponge and take it all in. Um, uh, but I'll, I'll, like I said, it was very, it was also very, challenging because I, I am like so many people. Have you guys ever heard of the term imposter syndrome? Have you heard that yeah, before? Yeah. I mean, I and, and quite a few of us in the industry struggle with that. It was really evident at that moment because there I am around such amazing, talented people that so many of them have gone on to do so much. Like if you look at the people I was at CalArts with and what they're doing in the industry and have been doing, it's incredible. It's just, I was, at, I was there at such a magical, wonderful time. So. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting that you mentioned that imposter syndrome because sat here listening to your answer to that last question, I was marveling at the focus that you you displayed. For example, going to Cal Arts and then continuing to do what you're doing now. And I think about like me going to university. I did a law degree because of parent pressure, and now I'm kind of floating around. Like I don't want to do that. I don't know what I want to do. So. I'm very much on the opposite spectrum as you in that I'm not very focused at all. I don't really know where I want to go in life. So I really do admire that you went, you know, you had the drive to pursue this and that's what you did and you stayed focused. So when you think about those days like Carl Arts, is there any that you like lessons that you learned then that you refer back to now as something that's like stood out to you as being quite, quite important? Yeah, I mean, so let me let me touch on that real quick too. You know, I'm I'm really lucky that I had a focus. I have two daughters uh, that are one is in the middle of going to university as well, and the other one's still in in high school. And one of them had the luxury of she knew exactly what she wanted to do, has been a jazz vocalist for a long time, and music business is where she wants to go. And everything was so easy because we could buy lessons and do that and help support her. Uh, my other daughter, like so many other people, which is more normal, is like they don't know exactly what they want to do. And that's totally fine. Like, congratulations for you for getting your degree and doing what you did. Um, but you'll find, but now just be open to, if I just can give advice, be open to what's out there. Like just this whole podcast experience, what you're doing with this, you'll find your way. Like, like trust and believe in and just following that. And that kind of goes along with part of the lessons from CalArts as well, is that 
all of us got to CalArts, I think, thinking we were going to be Disney animators, right? Like, that was just all you knew at the time. And then you discover there's so much more to that part of the industry. And by being open to it and just playing around is how you can stumble into uh, these different areas. Um, I think the biggest lesson I learned was, again, because of that imposter syndrome I was dealing with, I felt like I had to do everything on my own. I had to do my film on my own. I had to design everything on my own. No one could help. And the more I saw and learned how much it is to rely on other people around you, you don't have to make changes just because they're giving you a note or a thought, but to lean on your other your other coworkers or your other teammates, because they can yes and and plus things, and you don't have to do it by yourself. No one does it completely by themselves. Like they've, they've all got in, influences and, and inspiration and help from other people. So I think that was the one of the biggest lessons I walked out of there with was, I don't have to do this all by myself. And in fact, I shouldn't be. It, it's, it becomes stronger if I can lean on on other people that are that are good at what they do. There's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, I mean, thank you so much for your advice as well, because I think this is such a valuable part about about doing this for me personally. Like, I'm a bit like you were. Like, I'm absorbing things like a sponge, and I'm almost kicking myself that things weren't glaringly obvious. So, for instance, if I said that I wanted to go and do an English degree, it's, you know, how difficult it is to be a published author, not, hang on, there's about hundreds of TV shows being produced a year that need writers. And again, doing art, I was like, well why don't I do art? You know how difficult it is to be the next Leonardo da Vinci. And yet there's, again, hundreds and thousands of shows that are going to need storyboard artists, background artists, layout artists. So I'm almost sat here at the stage where I'm kind of like, oh, I wish that, you know, there's going to be someone watching this that's about to go through the university process or the school process and thinks, you know, this isn't all there is. Like we could potentially be in a position that, that you're here now, which is, I think is absolutely incredible. So thank you so much for sharing that. Yeah, no, thank you. If you don't mind, let me add one more thing to that too. Like I got into this industry and because of my insecurities that I will stop mentioning, because now that's the third time I've mentioned it, but um, because of it, my heart and my goal was I just wanted to be part of this industry, whether that was having my own show, which I still dream of and still want to do and will continue pitching and, and continue working on, or at the very beginning, at one point, I was like, all right, I'm going to be a production assistant on a show, and I might just be in that kind of a role and not really be in a fully creative role in this industry. It didn't matter to me. I just wanted to be around it and be a part of it. And I think that's the other thing that is so important is I don't want to tell anyone don't have big goals and don't have big dreams because you should always have them. But also maybe give yourself something that's like the reward that you can have that just getting to be a part of it is is part of the dream as well right so um yeah i, I just like I, I think that helped me i focused on the next step not looking at the top of the stairs like yes i knew what i wanted up there but i just focused where i was and kind of enjoyed that moment and enjoyed that lesson and continued to take steps as i moved on up through my my career like i've grown through and worked in almost every position on my way up which i think helps me understand everyone's job a little bit better. Yeah, absolutely. And just speaking about that insecurity, it actually surprises me because looking at your resume, there's so many iconic shows that are going to, and that have lasted the test of time, such as Johnny Bravo. It was so beloved back then, beloved now. And, you know, I think it will be well beloved way past my own lifetime. So it's absolutely incredible to see those achievements. But in terms of Johnny Bravo, again, it's like one of the most iconic shows growing up. Like, do you remember how this experience came about and what it was like to work on that show? Yeah, so this was really wonderful. At the time, I was right before Johnny Bravo, I was working uh, on a feature film called was either on Cats Don't Dance or had just finished another feature called Page Master. I'm not exact, I think we were on Cats Don't Dance. And Hanna-Barbera that had just become Cartoon Network had started a whole shorts program. They decided that they wanted to give opportunity to new people to see if they could create uh, shows that maybe could spin off into series. I had sold a short into that as well as a bunch of other classmates and other people. And that's where you got Dexter's Lab, Powerpuff, Johnny Bravo, Cow and Chicken, I'm probably forgetting a couple of others, but so I met uh, Van Partible while we were all doing our shorts and actually kind of helped a tiny bit when he was going into the development process on selling that as a series. I then left and finished Cats Don't Dance and then started my own company for a little while where I was going to do 
commercial work. I, we had connections in the advertising agency, and I also had connections to all the best talented people that do animation. So I'm like, and we can just do our own company where we're like this, this turnkey operation for all these different houses. And uh, it was fine. We did a little bit, but right as it was kind of not working out so well, I think I got the call from uh, Van saying that he was doing the series and did I want to come and be a storyboard artist on it? And I was like, of course I do. It would be so much fun. And it was a wonderful time. You know, well, that's the other thing. Seth McFarlane was where, that's where I really, I met Seth on the shorts program. He did a thing called Larry and Steve, which is almost exactly like uh, Peter Griffin and, and Brian. I don't know if you guys know Family Guy very well, but um, to then work with him again on uh, on Johnny Bravo was just, it was just fun. He was so, so incredibly talented and so funny. Uh, that whole crew was a, an amazing crew. Butch Hartman was there who went to create Fairly Odd Parents after that. So it's just so much fun to be around these amazing, iconic people in the industry that just changed the game. So Johnny Bravo was amazing. I had such a fun time. Not only was it fun from just a standpoint of we were all so playful and worked really hard, but played really hard too. It was a fun time. That time period in the industry was just full of of the younger kids kind of coming in and kind of changing it from the the older regime that had been there and uh it was fun it was a really great time and i think it showed i think johnny bravo shows it's like you know there's there's issues and you can you can knock it for again uh clarity or design or whatever issues but it worked for exactly what it was it was a perfect match for the style of comedy that john that that van partable was doing and i'm so thankful i got to be part of that oh and then in the original original opening title sequence i don't know if i put this up on my website or not the johnny bravo calls everyone out do the monkey with me and he's doing that whole dance and like me and another guy alex and another guy brad all caricatures of us all come in and start dancing with johnny bravo and it was like Woo! I'm forever like I will forever be on TV on this world in this animation world. It was such a fun, like I'm telling you, I had so much fun on that show. It was so great. And obviously, you mentioned Seth MacFarlane there, and I know you did work on Family Guy as a director. Um, was becoming a director part of your career plans in the early days of you becoming a storyboard artist, or did that just happen by chance? Yeah, I think what it is is that. Uh, not everybody wants to have that as their end goal. Some board artists are so good at it and are such in their perfect spot of being there. I think almost every board artist is a, is a director in, in disguise anyway, and they have to be of how they're dealing with it. Um, but since I still always have had this dream of having my own show and climbing there, uh, even when we did our own shorts, I directed, produced, wrote, boarded all those. So being a board artist and still climbing in that path on up to director was just the, the natural path for me to try and, uh, to try and, uh, uh, advance in this industry. When I went on to the show at, on Family Guy, um, I was really lucky because I thought exactly the way Seth did. I was the, I, I started as just an assistant director working with a really a talented guy named Chuck Klein. And immediately my boards were the ones that were getting like no notes, notes from Seth just saying like, wait to hit it out of the park. And there'd be like three notes in an entire 250 page board. So I think it was clear to them, like, why don't we have this guy directing? He's getting it right off the bat. Um, so it was it was just a comfort spot and it was the right thing it, it, and it worked out really well i went on to direct for a season and a half and then i'm sorry if i'm jumping ahead on anybody else but dan pavenmeyer who amazing creator amazing director amazing artist uh was leaving family guy to go do this show called phineas and ferb that no one had heard of and since he and i had such a great camaraderie in the in the kitchen we would have these fun fights where we do like donut eating contests and raise each other until we had eaten like 30 powdered donuts and we're both ready to die. Um, he invited me to come over and help him on Phineas and it was oh so so great and I'm so thankful I got to be a part of that show for as long as I did. So. Oh well on the topic of Phineas and Ferb obviously a bit of a different target audience was there um, any adaptation required on your end obviously you went from adult animation with Family Guy to then more family friendly with Phineas and Ferb? Yeah, I think the biggest adaptation was, you know, Family Guy was a script driven show and on sitcom script driven shows, the, the that's the Bible, you really don't mess with it. And if you're going to, 
it's, I mean, in my opinion, in any show, if you're going to mess with the script, you should get with the writer and kind of talk through the, the ideas and problems and try and make them stronger. Um, that show was not that you couldn't do that. It's just it was kind of not the way it was done. Whereas Dan's show, Phineas and Ferb, I don't know if you know, it was a premise driven show. So when I would meet with the board artists and launch out the, the premise, we would kind of boil it even back down even smaller to what's the real main core of this idea and then talk that through and then the the board artist would kind of expand back out from there stylistically dan thought thinks and directs the same way he did on family guy it's a very kind of flat simple kind of show style as far as uh you get dynamic when you need to for the for the moment but it's done like almost sitcom and it's it was a, a perfect transition for me because i could just kind of still think the same way but got to be more creative and add in jokes and ideas that were dan was so so open to accepting and getting everyone's involvement on the show which is why i still think that show is so it will like talk about last, lasting forever that show is going to go on and now there's the the talk of it fully being picked up so uh we'll see even more coming i think um, well, you've definitely worked on such iconic shows. Um, another one where you were the producer was um, Be Cool Scooby-Doo, mm -hmm. um, which has recently had a big rise in popularity, particularly because of people re um, recommending it in the wake of the new Velma series. What is your response to this? You know, uh, I think it's... I'm so thankful it's finally getting the eyes on it that it, that it should have had in the beginning. Um, we can go into as much detail as as you want on, and I'm fully uh, willing to talk about the reasons why I know it wasn't so well received up front. I think anything new that comes out Scooby Doo that's not the original is going to always get some flack. Um, I am I feel bad for all the people that worked on Velma that series itself because they're getting bashed and beaten up so badly right now, and those people didn't set out to make a bad show. They didn't set out to piss off fans they, they they thought they were doing something irreverent and new and fun it's not my cup of tea i tried watching an episode and it it really just wasn't it wasn't working for me um but uh like it's been so wonderful seeing all the like positiveness about be cool online but i'm never gonna sit there and slam velma to get be cool to be something that's raised i just wish on all these shows that people would give them the chance and not be so quick to judge. There were so many people slamming Be Cool Scooby-Doo before they, they never even watched an episode. They just assumed because of whatever they thought they saw or because 80 people said it looks like Family Guy or Brickleberry or whatever, that they then didn't like it and so they just said it wasn't good. And yet I will go to the mat with anybody and say, it's probably the, the most truest or the most yes and to the original show than anything i've seen to date we really really took those characters and took really good care with them and tried to just kind of add a little bit more life to them not 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 poop on the franchise you know so um i to, the, the short answer is i'm so excited like it's finally people are finally giving this show a chance and uh it's really rewarding to finally see that yeah, you'll get used to the look of it. It might not be my favorite style either, um, and it's not, but it, it that's not what sells that show. It's the characters and the stories that we're doing. That's what that's what that show is about to me, and it's always been that way. So, Well, I say this to anybody that we spoke to that's worked on Be Cool, and as a Scooby purist, I think we can all agree, hands down, it is one of my absolute favourite series. And mm -hmm. I'd at least watch an episode once a day of it. So I don't know how many times I've watched it. But um, yeah, it is just a fantastic series. So well done. Oh, well, thank you so much. So wait, so I'm going to flip the script on all of you guys then. If you like Be Cool, what is, do you have favourite episodes? Do you have a favourite, I and mean, I'm sure all of you have a favourite character, but do you all, do each one of you have like, and if you had to pick one episode, it would be blank or a moment. Like, and if I'm putting you too much on the spot, you can say you don't have an answer right now. That's fair. Uh, I guess I'll go first just to give uh, my co-host who I've roped into this some time to think about their answer. Right on the top of my head, an, an episode that's sticking out to me is Area 51 Adjacent. 
that's one that sticks out to me being a huge lover of sci-fi like going back to the early days of doctor who and stuff so all the area 51 stuff is is just incredible to me and favorite character both in be cool and scooby-doo in general is daphne so uh, yeah oh, nice. Nice. if this wasn't obvious i don't know <laughs> yes i can see clearly <laughs> Well, good. That's awesome. And like I said, you guys don't don't feel you have to answer that question if you're not if you're not prepared or comfortable with it. I just was uh, it was fun to just try and see what where your thought was. You know, thank you. But again, just to recap, thanks again so much for your 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 positive vibe and love of the show. That's all John and I set out to do. I'll, I'm gonna I'll tangent onto something, and you guys can keep this if you like it or not. Um, I was brought in for a meeting at at Warner Brothers back before Scooby actually started. I had heard about this Mike Tyson thing that was going on, uh, and I'm like, what's going on over there? Let me see what's happening. And when I walked into the meeting, I met with a couple of executives, and they were like, we're really interested in showing you this this new Scooby take that we're doing. And they showed me all this art that was really uh, inspired by the kind of underground comics of the 60s, and it was really kind of wacky and over the top. And they said, look, we love the kind of stuff that you did on Phineas and Ferb, and we wanted to know if you'd be interested in working on a comedic take on these characters. And that was kind of the extent of what they had given to me. And when I looked at it, I knew exactly what I wanted to do. I knew exactly who I wanted to work with right off the bat. Uh, writing, at least, was definitely John Colton Berry. And I said to him, like, look, if I'm going to do this the way I want to, these wonderful, beautiful, amazing drawings that you guys have done are not going to work with the style of what I'm trying to tell. And unfortunately, in production, once that train starts running and it's going down the tracks, you only have so much time that you can play or, or mess with things. And at the time, we already had an art director and a character designer attached to that show. And where I was trying to pull these designs, I can design, but I'm not a character designer, right? I can do backgrounds, but I'm not a background designer. I, I, I'm a showrunner. I'm a leader. I'm a director. I'm a writer. I'm a, I'm a board artist. I'm all of those things. So that area was me trying to give notes to someone to pull it to a direction that was holding on to what the studio liked in those original wacky drawings, but trying to pull it maybe somewhere that would work more with the kind of writing style John and I wanted to do. Unfortunately, the designer that was attached to it, and this is no slam on them, was not able to play in this world. They're not, someone that draws that fun and that loose and that wacky is not gonna be able to go into this kind of sitcom world and figure it out. And so I think that's where the show design wise kind of hit some of its biggest bumps was we couldn't find this answer. We couldn't, I didn't want to fire the the character designer because that wasn't their fault. I tried to work with them and then eventually time ran out and it was, we got to, we got to move on with what we got. Um, I still think at the end of the day, it works fine and it, it supports the scripts and it supports yeah. the stories. And I think so many people get used, like we all on the crew got used to it. We weren't sitting there every day going, oh my God, these are the ugliest things that I can you kind of find your love for it and make it work after a while. And I still think what we did to support the stories and the comedy worked really well. And the art team just knocked it out of the park on every other area too. So um, yeah, I just wanted to share that little story. Like it was wonderful. They allowed me to bring John on and we sat there and kind of retooled who these characters were gonna be and how were we gonna lift them up into a comedic ensemble while still allowing Shaggy and Scooby to be funny as well, you know, so. Yeah, no, that is understandable. And like you say, like it's kind of no secret that the main point of criticism for Be Cool was the art style. And, you know, I, I kind of don't really... I, every Be Cool Scooby-Doo interview we've tried to do, we've tried to avoid questions about that simply because it's kind of... Obviously, it's an important topic to discuss, but I kind of think that everything that is to say about it, at least from you know a fan perspective, has been said... But given that when people reacted to that, they were saying, you know, similar things to the first impressions of Velma. And now the script has flipped in a way where the first thing you see when you open Twitter, at least during the release of Velma, was a picture of Be Cool Scooby-Doo with captions such as, we owe this show an apology after the Velma show and stuff like that. Like, is there any animosity from your end in that people that are now appreciating Be Cool, it's kind of they've been directed to it out of negativity or is that kind of not something that enters your mind? Yeah, no, of course it did. You know, I, at the at the very end of the day, I'm just glad that people are finally watching and giving it a chance, right? And they're seeing it for what it really was. But um, 
Yeah, I mean, it sucked. We were we were trying our best to make a show that everyone was going to like and that was going to work. And the negativity that it got hit was was so overpowering. I, I knew it wasn't going to strike people right off the bat. Look at what came out before it. Mystery Incorporated is a gorgeous, amazingly well-designed show that was different from the original, but still really well-received in the art side of things. And so here we were coming up with this family guy looking or whatever people wanted to call it style show that just hit everyone in the face with this really abrupt thing but we kind of needed to do that we needed to say this was not going to be about the art it was not about the art this show was about the characters and the writing and what we were doing and we wanted to support that so um you know i feel bad for velma getting the show that that show getting the the hatred that it did because the same thing happened to us we didn't want like None, like, I, like I said earlier, none of us set out to make everyone mad. We set out to make a really good show. And when people didn't see that, it was kind of upsetting. I think my favorite thing, though, was in the very beginning, Sam Register, one of the main execs in Warner Brothers, gave us the note about how the show was looking like, like Family Guy. And I immediately went and put up a giant print up in my office of Velma, our Velma, and Meg right next to it and was like, if you put those two up next to each other, there's not, they're not, there's so many things that are not right. Doesn't mean you can't still perceive it as being that way. But I think, I think, like we said, that was more because people kept saying it that people kept on saying it uh, than it actually being the truth. And then I saw so many posts on Twitter about like, it's not the same thing. Like, and then like, if anything, it's more Brickleberry. And it's like, wow, what do you know? I just came from Brickleberry working on that. That happens to all of us too in this industry. Sometimes we kind of, pull from that last run that we were doing uh and bring it in unless there's a, a really established look to a show that we can all follow um i'm not sure if i answered your question or not no uh, you did perfectly in terms of i guess the reaction you know, the fan reaction but of course like fans for all the important part of the ecosystem without a doubt at the end of the day when a fan comments on something such as a tv show like that fan could have any type of background and knowledge to the industry, what works, what doesn't work, probably a lot less than the people actually working on the show. So in your opinion, how valuable is fan backlash or even just fan criticism or praise in fact? I mean, of course you want, uh, that's why it's so valuable now that we're having all the fans when John and I, and John did this more than anyone, he kind of worked on one fan at a time over the last couple of years and really got some got some people to kind of flip their, sorry, my phone's off. Um, they really got people to flip their, um, their opinions and give it a shot. And that's super rewarding. When you have the fans that have their name of their Twitter feed is something that's Scooby and they have that many followers. And all of a sudden they're like, oh my God, you guys give this a, give this show a chance. It's actually really good. It's really funny. It's really a, like respecting the, the original. Uh, that was so rewarding. Um, at the end of the day though, I will always continue to just try and make a show that I think is going to make me happy. And that's all I can try and do. And if the fans don't like it, I think that's what Velma just did as well. It's not for me. That show and that, the writing style, the comedy, the edginess that they were trying to go for uh, felt a little too forced and, and not in the right pocket for me. But I'm not going to, like, that was their attempt. And that's what made them happy. They tried it. Like, good for you for trying. Like, can you imagine the show's been around how long? How do you keep reinventing it? And there's an argument to say that maybe you shouldn't be, right? I think that's the thing that John and I tried to do that I don't think Velma did correctly. We stayed in the box enough that it was just, it was definitely showing that we had respect for the series, not trying to change something that is, that everyone's kind of used to so much. It's such a, it's such a weird choice. Like they should have just done a new show about a bunch of like kids that are going to solve mysteries and not have Scooby or Velma or anyone even attached to it. I don't understand the purpose of changing it as much as they did and and still calling it. That would be my, my biggest criticism to it. Um, yeah. Yeah, well, obviously in terms of reinvention of Scooby-Doo, obviously we've mentioned already, you've worked on Family Guy and Brickleberry. If you were hired to work on an adult take on Scooby-Doo, what would be the main aspects that you would make sure to get right? Hmm. Yeah, I don't know. I think John and I would have still done the same thing that we did. Like, to me, that is a, I, you know, 
I would rather do more smart family uh, style animation that could also be appealing to adults. I, I don't know that going for easy, cheap jokes, crass jokes would work. It would always still come from the comedy of the characters. Um, like, you know, John and I can be very uh, blue or whatever you want to call it. We can be very crass when we're alone in a room or we're walking. We used to do walks around the lot all the time as we would talk story and, and work on things. But I still don't think any of it was anything that was so ridiculous that we would ever be like, oh my gosh, we got to put that in the show if we ever make this for an adult audience. I, I think I think we did what we would have done had we been given, like, you can make any version of the show you want. That's kind of what makes us happy and laugh and have fun. I think that's what we what we did. So I don't know that I would do much different than what we already did with it, even if it was an adult comedy. I, I, I don't I don't think I would change it much at all. You know, I'm sure John shared with you, he and I had some of the same kind of love for Mel Brooks films like Young Frankenstein, for uh, uh, Monty Python films. Yes, those were adult, but they still were kind of tame if you think about what they were really doing in those shows. Maybe they said a bad word or something like that, but it wasn't it wasn't crass in the sense of trying to just push the envelope for the sake of pushing the envelope. So I think we would have probably done something very similar to what we already did. Or I would have. That's fair enough. And obviously on the subject of John, um, he's mentioned before actually he didn't actually like the title of Big Cool Scooby-Doo. We were just wondering if you could have renamed the show, what, what would it be called? Yeah, well, the worst thing ever to name something is put the word cool in it, right? Like, if you want to have someone hate your show, put the word cool in it. And when we first got there, we were fighting with Sam about we didn't like the title. We went in there one time with five different ideas. Believe it or not, one of them at the time was just Scoob. Like, we wanted to call it Scoob. And I don't know, we, we joke now and said, did someone steal that from us? But Sam, because of where his idea came for this show, because he was originally going to this kind of underground 60s comic, he was like, oh man, be, like it was, be cool, Scoob, be, like it was that kind of idea. So we're like, oh no, we're never going to change his mind up. Like we were done. It was a done deal. Um, but yeah, Scoob was one thing, I think. Uh, I can't, I, I, I don't really remember anything else. That's the only one I remember for a fact that we had said, um, but I'm sure we played around with it. And probably just wanted to call it like Scooby and the Gang or something at one point too. Like we just wanted to keep it not about some cool trendy title, just something simple that lets everyone know we're doing the same show. Um, yeah. Well, yeah, I I dig the name now. It's definitely a staple when someone says, "Oh, it's Scooby Doo series, be cool, Scooby Doo." You know. Um, going more back to the basics, how did your work on Be Cool Scooby Doo come about? So how did I get onto the show is what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I kind of touched on it a little bit earlier. I was looking for work. Uh, I was on a hiatus in between seasons two and three on Brickleberry. And uh, sometimes in the industry, depending on what your role is, you can get these little downtimes. And so I'm like, all right, I should look out there and get work either to float me through that time, or maybe it's time for me to move on to something else. And I met with people at Warner Brothers because I was looking for a job and they were like, we think we have the perfect thing for you. And that's when they started to pitch the idea of Be Cool Scooby-Doo. And, you know, my generation specifically, our Saturday mornings were filled with waking up with bowls of tons of sugar-baited cereal and Scooby-Doo and the cartoons that were on at that time. So although I had not watched or checked into any of Scooby-Doo's since my childhood, uh, it was super exciting to have a chance to get to play with such an iconic, uh, you know, cast of characters that is so loved and has been going on you know, Sam, the, the, the executive at Disney, uh, at Warner Brothers said, there's four things that keep the lights on this building. And that was one of them. He's like, Scooby-Doo is where we get, we keep doing it because it keeps working for us. And uh, kind of sad to hear that they just shut down a couple of other Scooby projects they were working on, right? There was a, there was a preschool show I think they were doing and something else, but hopefully this whole industry will figure itself out sooner than later and we'll get back to making tons of great stuff. Yeah, 100%. It's like, it's kind of weird at the moment. It's it's a, such a weird situation with Scooby where it's like the new CEO has almost earned a reputation as being the boogeyman of animation. But, you know, there's some indications that we can start to get back to some more, some more projects. So definitely being very hopeful for that. And I guess expanding upon, you know, Be Cool Scooby-Doo and, and the show, 
um, prior to you know setting up the interview officially, you kind of mentioned that the goal was not necessarily to go back and watch the old shows to replicate them, but more to just pick up from the top of your memory what you remembered about the shows. So what exactly, or I guess, what type of things did you remember that you wanted to bring over to Be Cool Scooby-Doo? Yeah, I'm glad you asked that question. You know, when I met with John and we started working on this, that was the first assignment I gave him was, look, I want you to be the keeper of the of the the real of I want you to go back and watch some of these episodes I want you to go and check and see I want to tell you and I want you and I to be more on the same page of what do we remember these shows being we remember them being really funny because I thought Shaggy and Scooby were hilarious I remember there being really cool mysteries that these guys were solving that you were like so impressed by at the end of them and like what a cool thing as a kid trying to figure out who the boogeyman really is and who the bad person was um I really remembered those song sequences with the chases that I thought were really, really exciting and fun. And at first, John, one of the things John and I wanted to do that he was more instrumental than I was at Phineas and Ferb was, we wanted to be really involved in writing songs for every single episode. It didn't work out. Uh, again, Sam Register had his choice of what he wanted to do in that respect. And um, I think we had too much on our plate to add that to it as well. We were, we were up against the wire almost all the time on these shows. Um, but those were the main staples to me. And then we, when I would go back and watch an old school Scooby episode, I'm like, wait a minute, they totally cheated on that mystery. There's no way that that's how that thing flew or whatever. And that's why I was so impressed with what John and I, but John, I'm going to always give him the, the main lion's share on this. Those mysteries worked and they were wonderful. That first episode about seeing someone's left-handed writing versus right, like, there's brilliant stuff going in there that actually works. And if you actually were paying attention, you might have caught those little things and could have solved the mystery in a real way. I think the hardest thing we had going for us was there was only ever like one or two other new people to the episode. So it's kind of like, hmm, I think it's one of them. It's probably the, the villain, right? You just didn't know exactly how or why, what their motivation was. So, uh, but that's that's definitely what I wanted to try and carry. If I were to say that there was a there was a fun idea of where as a kid I remembered feeling like I was along for the ride with these wonderful, fun characters that were trying to solve mysteries that adults couldn't solve. Right? Like how cool is that? Teenagers are fixing the problems, not the adults. And that was there was just something really cool about that that we I think I hope we tried to do and got got correct in the in the show. Well, you definitely hit the nail on the head, you know, the old versus your um show. Um as we um as we've discussed, a lot of people have just watched or will be about to watch Be Cool Scooby Doo for the first time. Um what are some of the things that you would advise to new viewers to watch or to keep in mind? Hmm. Keep in mind that what we did was we really tried to just yes and on these characters. I think we tried to build on what Everyone assumed Fred was. He was kind of the leader, so we gave him personality and and wants and desires that would help balance and and bend and bounce against these other characters by trying to be a leader. We took Daphne and said she's not going to be just the pretty girl in our world. She's much more than that. In fact, she's. I'm not sure if John talked about this on his uh, podcast or not, but we went. We looked at her as like, oh, if she was a person that came from wealth and privilege and is now finally out. For the first time, she's like Rapunzel being let out of the out of the tower. Like she's just got this desire to want to go in and experiment and, and explore the world. Um, and I think that came out. I think that I would tell people to look to see what we did with Daphne there. She's not a goofball. She's all of our characters are smart. They have personalities and drives of what makes them do what they do. And so therefore, that's why what they're doing is smart, funny, not just Oh, she's being a goofy character, right? Um, what else did I tell them to look out for? Uh, I think the first episode, we really got as close to what we really wanted to do with Belma by giving her that whole kind of, uh, I don't know if you recall in the first episode, she goes into the library and kind of has this Sherlock Holmes type. Uh, we were so inspired by that BBC program that we were, that was another layer we wanted to have in every episode was having that part of her um, be exposed and yet, it didn't really work out as much. We were, we, were, we were trying to do too much in every episode. And that was one of the things that kind of fell by the wayside. Um, I would also tell people if they wanted something fun, John and I came up with this idea, more John again than me, about 
Scooby, we gave him the rule. Did he talk about this? How Scooby can only sp speak in four words? Like, and it really kind of kept the comedy short and tight and fun. And it actually is not something you would know if you were just watching the show. You you shouldn't know it, right? It should be it should be like kind of just there. Um, but I think it really was a fun thing for us for a challenge for us to do. And John did it so well, and it just made that character so much funnier. It was so great. Uh, other than that. I would say watch what we did as far as being filmmakers, right? We th There's some really great directorial decisions and boarding decisions in that show that when you first look at it and assume that it's just going to be a family guy or Brickleberry, it's not. We did some really wonderful things with uh, cinematic at times and how we supported the the comedy of the show or the the action and drama of the show. So. Yeah, well, it, it's funny that you actually just mentioned about the rule of Scooby talking because I did a YouTube video a few years back defending vehicle Scooby Doo that John actually commented on. And the one thing he did is he was like, Oh, thank you. He was like, But can I just correct you? Because I'd said Scooby talks more than he normally does. And he said, No, uh -huh. we, had a, we had a rule in place that he could only talk a certain way. So that brought that memory back. Um, but also, um, Going through the show in order of what we see, IMDb credits you as the production designer of the opening titles. What was that like? Yeah, so what that means is that um, I met with a director at the time to, uh, we stayed, I think we even met on a weekend and just came in and decided to do a whole pass of what the opening title sequence would be. And again, that was something that John and I were originally working on as the song. We uh, did a pass that was not accepted by Warner Brothers. But the song that uh, the board artist and I worked on to create the opening title sequence was a temp song that we pulled from a library. And that one wound up being the one that we kind of still continued to jerry rig and cut and make it work to where it actually works really well, I think, for the opening title sequence. So for me, I was more of a director in that than anything else. I sat there and threw out ideas, did some thumbnails, did some, uh, gave notes along the way, but the board artist that worked on that, who was also a strong director for the series, uh, he's the one that really uh, that got, got the lion's share of actually doing the drawing for that. So that is really interesting. And one thing that's kind of vindicated me somewhat, it's kind of made my ears prick up a bit, is when you mentioned um, before how Velma, you know, that kind of mind palace sequence she had was almost based off the BBC adaptation of Sherlock and of course with mentions of Monty Python. I don't know what this is. I've said it so many times to a few people and they've all looked at me like I've just like spilled a drink on them, like they don't know what I mean. But something about the humour of Be Called Scooby-Doo just reminds me of old classic British comedy like, like Monty Python or Faulty Towers, like those old classics. So I was kind of curious to know how much if at all was old british comedy an inspiration for some of the humor of the show definitely definitely 100 percent. look john and i will talk about we have four different writers like ghosts of different writers in our rooms when we're working as our inspiration and as it's what john was raised on i was raised on most of it as well um i think i said this earlier mel brooks who's not british comedy uh um marx brothers but the you definitely go down the path of Monty Python and it's it's all over what we do. Um, we both that was one of our big connections when we first met on Phoenix and Ferb was our love of those films and how much we watched them and how much it's influenced our our approach and our our ability to look at things and pull into that absurdity that those guys would do and that sharpness and that 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 uh, the way that they handled their comedy was definitely an influence on the show. Hundred percent, hundred percent. Yeah, well, comedy is handled i think excellently and be cool and um, obviously you asked us earlier who our favorite characters were mine is daphne in general but i do have a soft spot for daphne in particular for be cool i think she's hilarious do you have a favorite member of the gang in mystery and then um, be cool yeah it's really tough i would have to go along and probably go with daphne as well i mean it's tough because i can go to they're all my kids if you will like i i turn to each one and i'm like what we did with fred and I, Gene Wilder was probably one of the like biggest comedic. I, I, hold, I, such, hold, I hold such a big space in my heart for Gene Wilder from what he did on Young Frankenstein, what he did in Willy Wonka. I mean, all of it. And so I know that John and I 
one of the main engines driving Fred is that character. So if I look at Fred and start watching some of his scenes, I fall in love with Fred, but then all of a sudden Daphne will come and I'm like, oh, but she's like a little bit of John in there too. And there's there's like, there's this love that I have for her. Velma will do it, Scooby will do it, Shag like they all at different points uh, bring in a part to me that it's just so, it's hard for me to say I would have one favorite, but I think, Daphne is the one that always pulled on me. If we're watching an episode, uh, did did anyone talk to you about how we came about? Did John ever talk about how we kind of got on the Daphne, the Daphneisms, how we got down that the Daphne du jours? Did you ever hear about how that happened? Um, the context that we got was uh, like you said about Daphne being sheltered and then going from the sheltered mm. dynamic to the independent dynamic and then making her beyond you know almost the construct that she fell into in the nineteen sixty nine show. So let me see, uh, she's not there. When we first got there, every drawing I saw of Daphne had her on these roller skates. And the idea was they thought, wouldn't it be funny if Daphne was constantly on roller skates and constantly out of control? And uh, the one of the really great execs on the show told us this whole story where it kind of came from, where he's like, oh my God, there was this one day where his kids were trying to learn how to roller skate in their house for the first time and were falling all over the place. And it was just the funniest thing ever. And unfortunately, John and I went, well, our characters are smart. They're not dumb. So if she couldn't learn how to ride roller and like work roller skates, she would ditch them. But wouldn't it be fun though, if we found something then knew that she would be trying every episode. And that's kind of where that, because of that idea that didn't work for us, but it sparked this inspiration to still kind of, you know, this happens in the industry all the time, especially with good creators or good good development people. The networks are gonna give certain notes and certain wants that they have. It's our job to go, all right, how do we give that to them, but in a way that makes us happy too. We don't have to give them exactly what they want. They were right to pick out that Daphne should have something she's dealing with. We then found a really smart way to get Daphne into a world, a point of view of the world from her that would then allow these kinds of things to come in. And then we actually did put her on roller skates in an episode at one point, just to kind of like, like tongue in cheek throw at that kind of moment. Um, but yeah, I'm not sure how many people knew that that, God, that would have been the worst show ever if every episode, <laughs> Daphne's on roller skates having to deal with her life. Like, that would get so boring and so out of control. Like, what is wrong with her? Why is she still wearing them then? Are they glued to her feet? So, um, but again, Daphne, from the beard to narrating to like just her take in every episode, John is a freaking genius. And I don't know how he does what he does. He came up with almost all of those in my opinion. And gosh, they're so fun. I, 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 every episode, I'm hoping that everyone's watching every episode going, What's Daphne going to do? Like, what's her thing this time, right? That's the hope, at least. And I, I think they almost always paid off, so. Well, I'm going to side with you guys. Daphne is my favorite as well. Um, we also touched on this earlier. Um, I know JB mentioned his favorite episode. To be honest, I really can't decide, like, oh, they're amazing. <laughs> they always get me cracking up. Um, I mean, one that I didn't think I'd like, which I love, is like um, All Paws on Deck. That's a brilliant episode. Um, but uh, do you have a favorite episode of Be Cool? Yeah, it's very hard for me too. Like I have I have ones that I like more than others. Not like I, I, I was lucky to be involved in almost all of them before I left the show during the middle of second season. So even those shows that went to the end, I still broke with John at some point. In some way, shape or form was involved in something that had to deal with those episodes. Um, uh, did uh, I think El Bendito, and if I were to ever tell anyone to watch an episode, I would say if you want to feel the flavor of what we were doing, the beginning of that episode, the cold open of it, the comedy that's there, the absurdity of like what they're seeing in the clouds, then the reveal of that monster is so intense and so like as scary as we could get. And then them in the car are like tricking Shaggy and Scooby and like, you lied to us in Spanish. Like, there's great that like John is just firing on all cylinders in that freaking episode in the beginning. And so that's why it's one of the ones I point people to if I'm like, you want to see the kind of comedy we were doing. Um, I love some Fred time, the first episode of season two, when Fred is just like losing his mind from solving so many murder, uh, so many mysteries that they try and give him a break and 
just how Daphne's about her house in that one and dorsal fit. Like, what a crazy, ridiculous uh, villain. Um, and there's that whole sequence when I'm sure if you've seen that episode, uh, Fred is, they've just come back into the house and Fred's like going up the stairs to go back into his room. And that is like straight out of Young Frankenstein with the put the candle back. I don't know if you know Young Frankenstein or not. If not, you should go watch that sequence and then go watch the sequence of Fred when they all come in the door and kind of are stopped as he's like kind of, there's this wonderful tension going back and forth. All Paws on Deck is brilliant. So the director of All Paws on Deck is one of, is one of the people that right off the bat when I was trying to get my team to see what I wanted the show to feel and look like he was hitting home runs on everything he did. Um, that was one of the episodes he did. I, all my directors, all my board artists, I love them all. But that person, for whatever reason, came right on in and was like, yes, this is the show I want to be making. He did it with, uh, uh, what's the chicken episode? Um, Game of Chicken. Game of Chicken, thank you. Um, like that was the first episode he did and it was like, yes, this is the style of the show. If you look at that compared to the first one, Although the first episode is wonderful because it feels like it's almost trying to look like the original as far as camera angles and how things are playing out and timing wise. So it was a good little transition to walk everyone into this is the style of the show. Um, the director who did All Paws on Deck, Jeff Mendicow, and did uh, quite a few episodes. I don't like the shorts that he did, the little half ones that were, um, and I'm, I'm not going to go much further than saying those didn't work for me, but everything else that he was a part of on that show, he just plussed it. But the other directors did too. I don't want to not put them to James, uh, per, uh, James, um, James Krensky and uh, the whole team. They, they all, once we started running, they all put their best in it and they all had their own little flair to it that really spoke, came through. Area 51 adjacent, not Jeff, but man, what a great episode, right? So uh, the scary Christmas one, and one of the other directors, like, just freaking amazing, right? Um, yeah. Anyway. I don't know if I that... I mean, going back to the El Bandito episode, um, we've never got season two on DVD here, but we've always got oh. season one. Uh, well, no, the first half of season one, sorry. But um, on, like, um, either special features or, like, special DVD releases, if it ever be a be cool episode, it will be always El Bandito. So it's just a great episode. So I've got loads of that on DVD. <laughs> good, good, good. I'm glad that they must have loved that one too. Then I guess right because it's a it's a solid one. It's got some really great scares in it too. At the like, it's got everything working in that episode. In in my opinion, it's really a a fun fun episode. Um, I think All Paws on Deck has more of the comedy hitting it or even more so where there's a will, there's a rape. Oh my gosh, that's again, one of my favorites. It starts out so cinematic. You watch that opening and that, it's not like a normal family or whatever. It's not this flat show. It's doing exactly what I wanted in the series is that when we needed the drama and the tension, the camera angles and cutting and, and everything supports it. And yet it perfectly supports all the comedy in that in that episode too. And there's some really silly stuff in there. Like the two girls that are finishing each other's sentences, right? Like it's great stuff. Oh, but he's a cat person, right? And comes out like it's a cat. Like there's so many great things in that episode. There's so many great things in this series. I'm so glad everyone's loving it and that you guys do too. You have no idea. It's so great. I mean, one last thing. Um, our um, children's broadcast, they're always putting Be Cool Scooby-Doo on. So it's on every single day, um, wow. prime time after school. So everyone's been watching it then. So oh, that's brilliant. awesome. That's awesome. Are they showing all, like, are they finally showing all two seasons? Like, is everything out? The only one that they don't is Scary Christmas. That's the bit. I don't know why they don't do it, but all the other mm. ones, they're running straight forward. So, yeah. That's great. That's great. That's good to know. Um, what were some of the highs and lows on working on Be Cool Scooby-Doo? Hmm. The highs were working with the crew and seeing what those, what everyone put into the show. Everyone put their all in there. And even when I'm sure they were looking at the designs at times and not 100% and behind them, they were behind me and behind John. And that was probably some of the best highs that I had. They, they worked so hard and put in their creativity and tried to plus everything where they could. Um, that's the most amazing thing because these shows can't be done without us working as a team, right? Um, working with John was probably the biggest high. I, I had worked with him on Phineas, but not on a day-to-day -day basis. 
he and I, I was a director working over multiple teams. So yeah, I would see John daily, but we weren't like this, like there was, there was like days in a row where from 9 a.m. till 6 p.m. we were with each other working and laughing and just having a ball on making the show. Um, the lows uh, would probably be, um, I wish we had the more money to have really kind of brought in a full writing team for John. I think that was the biggest struggle. You have no idea how much rewriting John did on these episodes and how hard it is to work with a freelance uh, crew when you're doing writing. He had a couple of people in there full times at different, at different stages, but if we could have had a full room of at least two, maybe three people in there, it's a big, it's a big issue in television production, in my opinion. A lot of them don't have the money for writer's rooms. It's not until you get into the sitcoms like Family Guy, we have 14 people in there, right? Like, look how much clearer, you have a much better chance of hitting a home run when you have that many talented voices in a room. Uh, all trying to solve the same problem and can split off and go can get fully involved and and uh enveloped in the entire style of what they would do when john would meet with somebody and talk to him for a day and then send them off to go write a script and they'd come back like oh my gosh how, they're gonna they're gonna fall right back into whatever the last scooby-doo they watched was and so it, it was it was a tough tough situation there um so i guess that would be it like You'll always hear that complaint that everyone always wants more, uh, more money to do more uh, to make the shows better. That's that, that would be my biggest low is that I wish we had more of that support for John. Yeah, I mean it's absolutely incredible that the show is so good. I mean, like you say, with that kind of kind of lack of resources in a way because you you can't tell like it is such an amazing show and I I am really glad that it's getting you know the praise and the flowers it deserves now because it's it's it, again I think it's going to be one of those ones that goes on to be timeless much like the 1969 series but in terms of like you know you being here today you've answered this question before I even had a chance to blink so I thank All you right. so much for that so I'm going to adapt it somewhat You've yeah. showcased your um, hoodie, of course, from Be Cool Scooby-Doo, and you've showcased that amazing poster in the background, which I'm still looking at with, with very greedy eyes. <laughs> but is there anything that you refer back to from you know your time working there that you wanted to, to jack or to be gifted that you didn't and you kind of regret in hindsight now? Hmm. I don't think so. You know, there was one artist on our crew she did an amazing piece that I've, I think I posted on a Twitter uh, pop somewhere. Um, her name is slipping my head right now. Uh, she did a really great kind of dramatic upshot angle of, of holding onto the style of the characters, but actually taking them just one step, like almost kind of like the development of where I wish we could have really taken these characters. And it touches me in a really great way. Cause again, it shows how much she loved the show how much she loved what we were trying to do, stayed true to the designs of where we were, but just took him one little spot, like to add some love and personality to him. I, I, I was like, it was so, I, I feel so bad that I never got an actual, I think she printed a couple of them out at the time. Um, I just have my own JPEG like version of it. That's not something I could print because it would probably be bad at that size. Um, but that's something I think I, I wish I could have, had from the show you know i try and stockpile digital files of things like store i have some animatics i have some storyboards that way that i can look at and and it's fun at some point i'll try and try and find somewhere to throw them up because uh for people to see because there's slight changes that are not you know there's jokes or things that we had to cut for time or whatever that will be in there that didn't make it to the finals um yeah, I, I don't know. I'm really happy I have uh, the digital images of, you know, we we were the first ones at one point, they, they used to have this giant billboard on the side of Warner Brothers Studio. And for years, it was like, Wonder Woman, Batman, like, like, literally like eight or 10 years. And all of a sudden, they said, Hey, we're gonna start changing this, this billboard up. Uh, we're gonna start changing it every couple of months or whatever. And we want your show to be the first show that gets a change on it. So I got to go and play and make all these fun ideas of what would I do if I did a billboard? And so I'm glad I still have those images because that was the time where I felt the most support from the studio. We were still in this 
early stage. John and I had done a, a like a, a little test piece, uh, an animatic test piece to show the comedy of the style of the show. And that went over so well. And then this billboard thing kind of came into talk and it was just like, it's at a moment where I felt like, wow, we're actually going to do it. We're actually going to, we're going to do the goal of people are going to love the show and just see what we're trying to do here. And we're, you know, we're, we're going to see floats in the Macy's Day Parade with our character there. You know, like my, uh, John, I'm just going to tangent for a minute. John and I talked about, you know, when you go to conventions and people obviously cosplay. I'm like, we will know that we finally made it when we see a cosplay character of our gang from the 19, uh, 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 the 1899, part of like it's 1899, where they're in those costumes. And I'll be like, now we, we won. We, we finally made it. Uh, I don't know if we'll ever see that, but it's to be so much, be so rewarding. Anyway. Yeah. Well, how about how about we we make a promise here and now? If you ever come to the UK for a fan convention, I will I will beg on my hands and knees for us all here to cosplay in those outfits. So let's let's set that in stone now. You'll just come in your bumbling gloves or whatever. You'll be uh, yeah, or you'll be flimsy for me. How about that? <laughs> oh gosh. Yeah. That sounds like a flaw. That sounds like a flaw. That's awesome. Well, thanks. So I guess my last question about, you know, about Scooby-Doo and stuff before handing off to Dan to wrap things up is, so with the if the rise in popularity of Be Cool Scooby-Doo, without a shadow of a doubt, that's going to translate to lots of downloads and numbers. And I'd assume somewhere within Warner Brothers, they're going to see a chart for Be Cool Scooby-Doo start to kind of dramatically rise up. So if someone there were to go, oh gosh, like this is in demand, we want to do more of these, would that be something that would interest you or would you be more interested in working on a different Scooby-Doo project or just, you know, kind of departing from Scooby overall now? No, I would love, like, I, I, I don't, when I left the show, it was not when I wanted to leave the show. Uh, I, I would have loved to have continued making more. I really enjoyed what John and I were doing. I really enjoyed what the crew was doing. Um, I don't know that my, I, I don't know if maybe certain people at Warner Brothers might have to change for me to be back there working, or maybe there, maybe we'd have to have a hug it out lunch first before it were to happen kind of thing. And really maybe give me a little more respect and control of what I think I would want. Um, that being said though, of course, I mean, we, I love these characters. I still think we could have done, we had so many plans of what we wanted to do with them that in a minute, if someone were to come and say, hey, we want you and John to start up again, would you be interested? Um, like I said, I think the only thing I would really want is maybe just, I've also grown too. Let me say something real quick. Uh, who I was on that show was a different person than I am today. And I think I wasn't as confident in making some of the pushback that I should have at times. And I would love to know what that would do with me walking in with this series if it were to get picked up for another set. We wouldn't change it much. I think what John and I delivered, clearly it's working, right? So I think we would still do something very similar to that. Maybe we'd push the designs a little bit, but then that would be weird too. Like if all of a sudden everyone's saying, no, 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 we like this the way they are, you know, maybe I'd get that one artist on our crew that, that did that great poster to maybe do another pass of the design and see if we could find a happy medium that the fans would be like, all right, this is close enough to both. Um, but yeah, I, I, I would love, I had so much fun with these characters. I, I wasn't done with them when I left, but I kind of had, I had to be done with them at the time. So uh, I would gladly go back and do more with them if they wanted us to. Well, we, I think we could all say we'd be more than happy if you were to do that. So we'll see what the future holds. But um yeah. In terms of the future, do you have any upcoming projects that you'd like to share with us? Um, I, you know, the the last show I worked on was a Netflix show that was a preschool show that was uh, created by Sanjay Patel, who was uh, an ex Pixar guy who does gorgeous, beautiful uh, illustrated books, children's books as well. Uh, it's probably one of the the most beautiful things I've ever worked on. As far as if you want to talk about how people wanted to knock Scooby for how it looked this show looks better than anything I've ever worked on or touched. Um, and it has great comedy and great charm and great music and great everything that's to support it. Uh, we're not sure about its release yet is the worst situation. There's some, some problems with them actually figuring out how and when and where, and even if they're going to release. Uh, 
But besides that, that was the last, like, here's the problem. You get on a show in this industry, you're on it for like three years, four years. So if that doesn't hit, and this has never happened to me before, but if it doesn't launch, you know, that will have been the, the thing before it will have been a Lego thing. Or I got one last thing. I got so lucky, as I told you, my first drawings as a kid was drawing Snoopy all the time. And I would trace them in the very beginning and then I would get to school and people eventually called me out on it and said they thought I was tracing and put me on the spot and I was able to draw them because I had traced them so many times I was able to draw them and so I always have an affinity towards Snoopy. There was a series that came out on Apple uh, over the last couple of years, the Snoopy show that I got to work on and do a little bit. And it was kind of a really nice kind of full circle to finally be able to work with characters that were being treated with the respect and it felt like Oh, this feels like the original Christmas special I grew up with in the comic book or the comic strip. So um, if, if people haven't checked it out, I would, I would, if you have Apple TV, that's something I had worked on that I only worked on a few episodes, but it's, it's really well done. It's really, really charming. Um, other than that, I'm just working on other projects in development right now. I'm developing my own shows, so we'll see. Maybe one of those will take off and finally, I'll finally have my own show that we're uh, working on. Um, but I'm also taking meetings around town to possibly work at one of the big studios again and help them do kind of what we did with Scooby, like help them take something that is in development or someone that has sold uh, a show and is kind of new to the industry. If you look at my track record after after Phineas, that's kind of a lot of what I did from Brickleberry to even Scooby to uh, what I did with Sanjay is I work really well with people that are are have an idea, have a really strong passion of what they're trying to create but don't know enough about our industry side that I can come in and still give a little bit of input and creativity to where I feel connected to it, but I'm not, I'm not trying to change what they're trying to make and kind of support them and help them reach exactly what they want out there. Um, I, I love doing that. I love being that kind of mentor that way. So I'm down for that kind of a job again as well. And that's part of some of the things I'm looking at. And one last thing, John and I are actually working on something that I don't know if I can talk about, but uh, we're in development on something for a franchise, a, a restaurant that is trying to, to do something to kind of wake up the franchise a little bit. And uh, once we have official word on that, I'll, I'll say what it is, because I don't know if our NDA, if we're allowed to say what it is, but uh, we're starting out with a Christmas special, which is perfect for John and I, and maybe 20 shorts to go along with it. So who knows? Again, that's like two years from now. So like, <laughs> talk to me in two years. We'll see if it's coming out or not. I'll let you know. I'll definitely be keeping an eye on your work in the future. Um, and just one last question. Um, is there an ideal place for people to keep up with your work? Do you have a website? Are you on social media? I do have a website. I am on social media, but I don't really post very much. Uh, it's too like stress inducing for me to have to feel like I have to do something and have to be current and have to constantly post. I probably should be in the industry, but um, I'm more of a, I'm more like to go around and look and see what everyone else is saying or doing. And I love the like button is my favorite thing. So I'll repost and, and like the heck out of a lot of things. My website is probably the best thing to check out. If you really want to see what I'm doing, what I've last worked on, cause everything that I'm allowed to put up there is up there. Um, and people can reach to me that way too, if they ever wanted any kind of advice or inspiration or whatever, I'm, my email's on there as well. And I will usually try and respond to people if I can. So website is the best place. I don't know how you guys, if you have a link, how you would put that up for them, but um, it's just my name, uh, ZachMockRief.com. And it's just Z-A-C. There's no K, there's no H, there's no, uh, my parents thought I couldn't remember more than three letters. So they just kept it easy. So uh, there you go. Yeah, well, well, I will be sure to leave that in the description down below. I can put links in there quite easily. So I'll be able to, to direct people to that. And this is the part of the show where normally I'd be thanking you for your time and everything. But before that, I do have an additional message for you. So um, close friend of ours, Tori, Tori Scooby fan on Twitter, unfortunately couldn't make it today, but she wanted me to thank you on her behalf for, you know, all the work you did on Be Cool Scooby-Doo and just how much he loves the show and how important it is to the franchise. Well, that's so sweet. Thank you. Pat. Uh, big thank you. Um... You know, John and I try and go on Twitter all the time. And, and when people are, are tagging us or tagging the show in there, we will respond. So please let everyone know if they ever want to uh, hear back from us. If As long as you're not, like, if you're slamming Belma, I'm not going to come in and be like, yeah. If you have something to say about our show or 
whatever, or you have a question, throw them up there, and John and I will always try and sneak in there and throw some kind of feedback because it's so so wonderful that people are taking the time and being positive. It's so easy to be negative on the internet, right? It's so easy to go and slam things. Um, the fact that people, like you said, the amount of people that were saying we owe you an apology was so, so sweet and so rewarding. Um, I just hope it continues to spread. I hope like you're like you're all saying, I just want more people to see the show and see all the, the, the work that everyone put into it. I want people to have that chance to really feel vindicated for the fact that we all knew we were doing something special. And uh, I'm glad to see that it's catching on finally. Oh, thank you so much. We're definitely all looking forward to keeping a close eye on things and to continue to enjoy Be Cool Scooby-Doo and whatever else you do next. So thank you so much for the time you've given us today because you have been incredibly generous with that. And so we do definitely thank you. And I guess for the sake of the video, um, Sophie, where can people find you on the internet? Yep, you can find me on Instagram at Scooby-Dooby-Doo for life. And Dan? Uh, yeah, I'm on Twitter and Instagram. I'm DanFaz94 on both. Definitely be sure to check those out because, again, I have the worst social anxiety ever. I'm sure that if it was just me that could make it today, the tone of this interview would have been very different. You would have probably had to have bear with me while I breathe in and out of a paper bag for a second. So I am so grateful to both Sophie and Dan for joining me today. And of course, again, Zach, thank you so much for all the time you've given us. And again, for Be Cool Scooby-Doo, because it's definitely a show that we all love so much. Oh, thank you so much. I, I can't wait to continue to do more things that hopefully everyone will enjoy as much. And let's hope the next uh, the next version of Scooby-Doo comes out and is just as wonderful and and charming and, and true to the original and is just continuing these characters to live on forever. We definitely echo that, echo that sentiment there. So... Thank you so much to everyone for watching. If you do want to see more, then please like, comment, and subscribe. And we'll see you in the next one. Woo! Bye, everyone. Go watch me, cool Scooby-Doo. <laughs>